Thoughts by Brian D.K. Introduction Background and Chronology I began writing seriously after I dropped out of art school. I had become disillusioned with the way art was taught in the four different colleges I had thus far attended. I'm not sure if I fell in love with writing or just became addicted to it. In any case, I have continued writing for several hours every day since about 2006. I re-entered college in 2010 and graduated in 2014, again focusing in fine art, painting, with a secondary focus in anthropology. Throughout this time, in addition to writing academic papers for my classes, I also continued my habit of writing daily for my own personal projects. Most of the writings in this book correspond roughly with the years in which I completed my college education, plus the following year, 2010 to 2015, more or less. Making the illustrations and editing the text continued intensely from 2016 to 2018, then intermittently between 2019 and 2022. Overall, the work spans over a decade. Neither the writings nor the drawings are placed in strict chronology with regards to their genesis. Rather, they are placed in a loose chronology. That is, the earlier drawings and writings tend to be towards the front, and the later drawings and writings tend to be towards the end. This was done to give some sense of the evolution of my thoughts over the years 2010 to 2015. However, the ultimate placement of the writings was chosen more according to the overall flow of the material. I feel it is important to mention that my first daughter was born while I was still a university student. My college experience was atypical in that sense. I was a bit older than the average student and had to provide for a wife and child while studying. That kept me very focused. It certainly is relevant to how my thoughts developed during this time. The Illustrations I made the illustrations in this book using digital media. I originally wanted to make woodcuts, but that proved too time-consuming. To get the look somewhat similar to physical printmaking, I used a simple process. I made a black fill and used an eraser tool to scratch away at it. Most of the images are on a single layer. I began to play a bit with multiple layers as I worked on them over the years. The resultant look is neither wholly like relief printmaking nor etching. It is probably most analogous to scratchboard. I did not try to hide the telltale marks of the digital stylus so as to leave the drawings honest to their medium. I chose to use vector images for all the doodles accompanying the translations of non-English texts, as well as for the handwriting used for the translations themselves. Again, I left it apparent that these are vector images and treated them much more casually than the pixel-based images. Many of the images are traced directly from photographs or photo collages I assembled for the purpose. I think full transparency on this is a good policy for artists these days. Even with the aid of tracing, the most complex images still took many hours of work and sometimes several days to create. The Tabernai The Tabernai are like larders full of contextual information to aid in the understanding of these thoughts. Nowadays, when the sum total of all human knowledge vastly exceeds what any one person is capable of learning, an author cannot possibly expect the reader to be familiar with each cultural reference we may want to make. Even if we were to confine our expectations of an educated person's exposure to knowledge pertaining to culture, as culture is generally understood, this too now greatly surpasses what any one person is capable of processing. Moreover, I want these thoughts to be accessible to anyone regardless of their level of education or specific educational focus. 
The tabernai provide succinct descriptions similar to what one might encounter in an encyclopedia. They occur at arbitrary intervals throughout the book to provide information on the writings that the reader will encounter in the coming pages. The concepts contained in the tabernai are not organized alphabetically, but rather by the order in which the given concept appears in the thoughts that follow. I chose to call these sections tabernai, singular, taberna, after the Latin term for a kind of exterior room found in certain buildings of ancient Roman cities. These rooms opened to the street and were used for commercial purposes. I envisioned my tabernai as little storerooms where those traveling through my writings could pause to load up on supplies that might prove useful for the next leg of the journey. If you feel well supplied, with no need to stock up for the journey, then by all means proceed and do not waste your time in the taberna. A quick glance at the shelves might be enough to confirm whether there is anything you might want to stuff into your satchel before continuing. I want to assure the reader that it is entirely up to them whether they wish to read the tabernai or pass them over. Life is short, and this book is an experience crafted for pleasure. You should only be reading these words if you find something enjoyable in them. If you find any part of it laborious, or if the labor does not seem to offer a return on your investment, then by all means abandon it. In any case, you may find that you are able to understand my thoughts without the contextual information provided in the tabernai, or you may arrive at an alternative understanding that deviates from what I intended, but could have interesting merits of its own. A special note for the audiobook recording. After much consideration, I have decided to omit all eight of the tabernai from this audiobook recording of thoughts. This choice pains me, as the tabernai are an essential part of my book, and I invested an enormous amount of work into them. Each taberna opens with a quote on the left page, and though I hate to admit it, I will confess that simply choosing these quotes took me years to decide upon. Each quote faces an illustration on the right-hand page. All the illustrations in the tabernai are based on ancient Roman frescoes to enhance the sense of entering a real Roman taberna. The inner section of each taberna is heavily decorated and ringed around with a thick, dark border that helps the reader when flipping through the book to identify whether they are in the taberna or just one of the sections of poetry and prose. I feel strongly that these tabernae add significantly to the other things that make my book thoughts unique. Both aesthetically and philosophically, they are integral to my vision for this book. However, I simply cannot pretend that the tabernai function in audiobook format the way they do in print. When one flips through them in print, one's eye can scan quickly over whole sections of text, diving like an eagle on anything that catches one's interest while feeling free to ignore the rest. One cannot do that when listening to a recording. If I were to read the tabernai out loud, it would sound as tedious and as disjointed as someone reciting a dictionary or encyclopedia. So, I have opted to avoid such an awkward configuration and have also abridged the introduction which goes on to describe the style guide I invented for citing works within the tabernai, as well as acknowledgments to the friends that helped me to polish the poems that appear in Spanish, Italian, and Nahuatl. There are only a few of these, and they lie scattered through the flow of the material, as I felt it was odd and unnatural to segregate them into their own little sections. Each non-English text will be followed by an English translation. However, again, the visual cues will be missing in this audio context, since in the print version, the translations are clearly indicated by appearing in handwritten font. 
I'll leave you now with the quote that opens the first taberna. I felt this was my duty, my sole duty, to draw the thick ancestral darkness out of my loins and transform it to the best of my ability into light. Nikos Kazantzakis, Report to Greco.